Namaste. My name is Anishka Rangwal, and I'm happy to be a return presenter. My last paper that I presented at a WAVES conference was based on the idea of secularism in the Vedas. This talk is based on my WAVES 2024 paper titled Nyaya, How Ancient is Nyaya in Ancient India? I hope you find my research useful, and I look forward to learning from your comments and enhancing my research. Please feel free to ask me any questions after I am done presenting. Thank you. So what exactly is the history of law globally? Why is it relevant in conversations of civilization? It's known that a region's legal history goes in parallel with its overall evolution and is proportional to the civilization history. The oldest recognized legal doctrines are from Egypt, around 3000 BCE. After that, we see Sumerian history containing some examples of legal doctrines developed around 2200 BCE. And then fast forward to Babylon, which is Babylonian history mentioning King Hammurabi, who is famous for having created the Code of Hammurabi in um, 1760 BCE. It was implemented and used widely throughout that region. Then came Greek law in 650 BCE, followed by Roman law from Byzantine Emperor Justinian in 6th century CE. Chinese Confucius-based law is the oldest continuous running legal system. And then finally, British common law based on precedence and uniformity across the kingdom, which was developed in 1100 CE. So the democracy that we see globally today is said to have come from Greek law. Ancient Greece's practice of law was done without judges and up to 500 jury members acting in mass to give verdicts on the same day of the trial. Litigants were allowed to use speechwriters instead of attorneys. Many of today's American judicial doctrines originate in Greek law. Roman law, however, was based on the 12 tablets and formed the basis of civil law in the Western world today. So the word nyai has two distinct meanings, law versus darshan. So the one that my paper is based on, which is the most commonly understood meaning by most speakers of Sanskrit, Hindi, and related languages, is the fact that this meaning has to do with laws, jurisprudence, rules, justice, verdicts, court, etc. Everything that you would associate with the word law. The other less understood meaning of the word nyai has to do with one of the six schools of Indian philosophy, also called suddarshana or six darshanas. Nyaya Darshana essentially prescribes the process of doing another kind of investigation using fourfold steps of perception, inference, comparison, and analogy. Nyaya Darshan's main purpose is to discover the ultimate truth or attain moksha. So the difference between these two definitions is one is based on how we implement law into the materialistic overall world today, and Darshan is based on the spiritual meaning of Nyaya. Nyai in ancient India is described in many places um, of Vedic literature. Though some of the Nyai books did not survive, Vedas refer to a total of 16 dharmshastras dealing with Nyaya. Only a few of those today are still extant. Many of them perished during the various invasions and destructions of many great universities and libraries in India, such as Nalanda. These particular smritis dealt with legal principles and were written by rishis. These books were time-bound and often amended, like all smritis are supposed to be, to reflect changing times, circumstances, etc. Some of the contents may not make any sense from one epoch to another, while some content is eternal. So how do we determine the age of these nyaya or law books in the first place? So let's talk about Prasara Smriti. Prasara Smriti. This is the oldest extant ancient Indian law book, and it was written by Prasara Muni, who was around during the Mahabharata times. It's mentioned in the Vedas that Prasara Smriti was for Kali Yuga times, which is the final of the four yugas. So the Dharma Smriti is written for the older ones, Satyug, Tretayug, and Dvapariyug, must have been much older than Prasara Smriti. Satyug had an older ver version of Manusmriti than is extant today. Treta Yuga had Gautam Smriti and Dwapar Yuga had Shank and Likita Smritis. Since the colonial historians dated the Rig Veda and epics to 1500 BCE to 500 BCE, the creator of those states himself, Max Mueller, admitted that he did it out of not much basis of facts and um, evidence and it was most likely erroneous. So he basically put it out of his own inferences, so to speak. It wasn't too much factually based. Mahabharat, based on many evidences contained in its text, is now considered to have happened sometime between 5th and 3rd millennium BCE. If this is the case, 
this would make the Prasara Smriti the oldest law books extant globally. So Manusmriti of ancient India. The first Smriti to be translated into English was Manusmriti in 8th century CE by um, the East India Company to administer law to the Hindu colonies in India. Smritis were constantly amended, as I've told you in previous slides. So the dating for Manusmriti was moved from 1200 BC, 1250 BCE, originally proposed by its English translating scholars, to 2nd century CE, based on circular faulty logic. The original translators dated the document to 1250 BCE, but since it was written after the Upanishads and the Upanishads were erroneously dated to 500 BCE, the Manusmriti had to be illogically dated to 200 CE. So continuing on the Manusmriti, it's a constantly changing document and it is quite possibly the oldest Dharmshastra, as old as the Indus civilization in itself. This document is written by many persons as the language and content clearly indicates. If you were to read through the Manusmriti all in once, it wouldn't be very clear and it'd be rough to read if you didn't know all the languages that it was conversing in. Prasara Smriti even mentions Manusmriti as being relevant to Satyug the oldest of the four yogas. There are mentions that the original Manusmriti was 100,000 verses long with 1,080 chapters. It keeps on getting modified, portions were deleted, and new input by many authors were happening over the ages. So it was like a running commentary of all of the ancient times. So let's talk about the Ramayana and Mahabharata. Even though the Ramayana and Mahabharata are not law manuals as explicitly defined, they do contain a lot of opinions, instances, examples of the prevailing systems of legal um, pursuit in India of the time. Courts were, courts were prevalent, a council of judges passed verdicts, public hearings were conducted, public opinion was taken on important matters, debates on policies were conducted, property law, contract law were displayed, evidence law, grievous hurt. In many an instance, in the Ramayana and Mahabharata. So we can obviously see that yes, they are not considered law manuals, but if reading upon them, you would notice many an instance of legal examples being notated. So ancient Indian features of Nyaya. Brihaspati Samhita in ancient Dharmshastra prescribed that a plaintiff must be informed of his previous defeat on the same matter and couldn't bring a suit on that same subject again. This was called prangnyai or res judicata today. Modern legal doctrines are mentioned all over the epics and dharmshastras, as can be seen in this and the following slides. The legal system was obviously very, very evolved in ancient Indian times. Because, so more continuation on the features of nyai in ancient India. I say that our legal system used to be really advanced because of this. Something you don't see much in ancient history is monarchs limiting themselves to the laws that they create as well. In many instances, the monarch is overpowered or considered a god or above the law. A special feature in Indian society was that the monarch himself obeyed his own laws. There were open courts and judges couldn't talk to private parties privately. There were very strict guidelines for appointing judges to avoid corruption in their legal system. And if they were found being corrupt, um, there'd be very strong punishment. Council of judges and head justices were established, which were called Pradhivikas. The members of the jury had input into the Jayapatra, which is the verdict. So, okay, you know the time old saying goes, guilty until proven innocent. This is the common mindset for the Western world today and overall ancient human schools of thought. Ancient Indian history, however, was unique in the way that they provided innocence until proven otherwise. Laws were evolutionary and not eternal, which is a continuing theme in overall ancient India as seen with the Manusmriti as well. The Shastras mentioned laws will be unique and different for each era. Most civilizations ran off with one code or legal system that they were just bound to. Ancient Indian civilization, however, understood the importance of encouraging innovative growth in fields such as this. There was no trial by supernatural methods, either argue logically or find evidence to back your case up. Historical Indian society had forward thinking skills. But now a more interesting portion of Nyaya, how did the British empire affect legal system in India? So the British imposed Manusmriti in order to control the Indian populace. But the thing was that the Manusmriti was never supposed to be used as a text 
that could be decided, that could be used to decide things in legal instances. The British Empire throughout many centuries of social, ethical, and legal development, as they've always done. So imposition of Manusmriti doctrines on India by the British went against the very core of Manusmriti, which says here, Paritea jadar takamav yausyatam dharma varjitav dharmam chapas chapyusako dharkam lok sankrstamevacha. Dharm rules supreme and codifying laws that go against dharm is not correct. And Manusmriti did not claim to contain laws, just commentary and guidelines. India had a thriving society which had many centuries of development against social, ethical, and legal systems by imposing and freezing the contents of Manusmriti, which caused a lot of harm to Indian society as a whole. We didn't find any good literature on the ill effects of hard coding the contents of Manusmriti into laws in Hindu society by the British. But this would be a worthwhile topic to research someday. So in conclusion, Nyaya is the definition that my paper focuses on today is related to law, jurisprudence, rules, judgment, and it has a very long history in India. It is as old as Indian civilization itself. And there being a lot of discussion, examples, principles of law in the Ramayana and Mahabharata, Vedas, Nyayas, Shastra, Smritis, it's clear that the legal doctrines were very advanced and based on what is dharmic or righteous. It also seems that the history of Nyaya in India is far older than even Egypt, which is currently assumed to be the oldest example of human law as a whole. So this was my presentation on the history of Nyaya, how ancient is Nyaya in the history of um, law. Um, please feel free to ask me any questions.